So welcome everyone to the, I don't know which edition data science seminar. I hope you uh, are counting, I, I haven't. So it's definitely N more than one. Um, we have had this uh, in the past and these were relatively successful. So we thought that it makes sense. It actually suits a lot of different purposes. We would like to get to uh, kind of get in touch with uh, each other because I see a lot of uh, people that I know. The Institute of Computer Science and uh, other departments, but also uh, students, also general public. So it's um, it's this kind of event that seems to be trying to match different objectives, and we have been relatively successful in that. So it makes sense to uh, continue. And today's seminar is specifically, to my surprise, I didn't start. Uh, it was a big surprise. I, I didn't start it. Uh, and the surprise is that I have been working with semantics exploitation for a while now, I think for five or six years. And uh, it's uh, something very close to my heart. Um, and it's not just my heart, but many other hearts uh, out there. Because semantics segmentation uh, turned out to be a very important step in many uh, data analysis uh, processes. And uh, whatever people kind of uh, work with data, with the imaging data specifically, they like to start was kind of saying which objects are and where they are on these images. So whatever you're working with, with satellites, with cells, with uh, cars and pedestrians, you might end up wanting to know whether there isn't, uh, there's something on the image and where that something is specifically located. I guess we can uh, proceed to my slide. So this is my talk. Um, I will start with uh, the set data science seminar with um, something that I consider to be important in the field of semantic segmentation and something that I find to be very fascinating in terms of research. So I, I am a researcher, by the way, I, my name is Dmitro Fishman. I am a lecturer of artificial intelligence at the Institute of Computer Science. I teach, and uh, many of you know me as a, a lecturer of machine learning these days. And also, I'm actually uh, leading a group on biomedical image analysis. So that's why uh, there's this connection to semantic segmentation, is because we actually do semantic segmentation. A lot of it, actually. Um, yeah, a um, couple of words about what, I'm, uh, what I wanted to talk about and why did I select this topic. I wanted to talk, uh, to talk about uh, cases, and most of you are familiar with basic machine learning pipelines when you have label data, you fit it into your model, and then hopefully your model becomes good enough to understand same or similar situations in the future and handle it. I'm, I'm relatively recently became very interested in circumstances when you don't have much of the label data. You just don't have it. And for one reason or another, you just, just don't get along that, that much. So um, uh, the research that I have been, and my group that we have been working on recently was investigating various ways to work with no data, limited data, bad data, whatsoever. So that's the, hence the title of the talk is Undersupervised. So super, uh, we were supposed to, but we couldn't, right? So we failed. So what are the ways to go about this? Um, I am going to fail myself in a way that I'm not going to bother you too much because I have 20 minutes and probably less in counting. Uh, to explain everything I wanted to explain, so I'll skip the biological details. So my group is about analyzing cells. I'm not going to talk too much about what are these cells and why do we work with these cells, and I'm just going to stick with an idea that we want to find these cells. But to start with, I just wanted to show you the example of why the semantic segmentation, in, in case you wandered in this room and you are not familiar, which I don't think is the case, but still, so if you wandered in this room and you're kind of still not very clear about what semantic segmentation is, then semantic segmentation is basically providing every pixel in the image a class, right? Saying whether this image, whether this pixel belongs to an object of interest or it doesn't. For example, in this case, saying that these pixels belong to a pedestrian and the rest of the pixels are background, right? We as a, <clears throat> and this is example explicitly taken from autonomous driving, when you don't want to get into trouble and you want to know where pedestrians are in front of your car, right? Or if pedestrians are in front of your car. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, what semantic segmentation is all about. 
um, figuring out which pixels belong to an object and which do not belong to an object. And now, um, just giving you an idea that this is not the only thing that uh, semantic segmentation is capable of, not only finding pedestrians, cars, and whatever you on the image, you can also find, let's say, buildings uh, from satellite images or crop fields from satellite images, or as in my case, you can also look for cells or nuclei. So these are nuclei in the microscopy images, all right? You can have images of a planet, you can have images of individual people, and then you can have images of cells. You can have multiple layers of that kind of stuff. Yet, the problem is the same. And it's called semantic segmentation, and it's basically figuring out where the objects are uh, on your image. Um, the very basic setup that uh, we have been working with, which is a very strongly supervised approach where you have a bunch of data, you have a model in the middle, and then you have input data, which is in this case I call bridal images. All you have to know about these bridal images is that they are complicated. And it's very hard to find out where the cells are in these uh, complicated bright images. So um, it turned out to be possible with a UNET type of model, just a deep learning, uh, standard deep learning framework. You just fit it in with the label data, and here you go. The model is capable of finding uh, cells in the complicated bright images. The question that somebody may ask themselves or myself is where these labels come from. The thing is, finding cells in these images is complicated even for a human being like myself who have been looking at bridal images for a very long time. So it's, it's complicated. Where do these kind of come from? And this is, I think, the very first step you may take when you're facing similar problems is that when you have to label some images or you have to find out where the things are in those images, but these are complicated. You yourself don't know where these objects are. Um, so one way to go about this is to have something of a different domain. So the image that is of the same object, but coming from a different angle. For example, in our case, we have these bright field images, but alongside you can also have something called fluorescent images. And these are basically highlights of the cell nucleus, right? You don't see anything else, but you see the nuclei. They are shining bright, uh, bright into your face. And it turned out that uh, segmenting these was relatively easy using classical algorithms. So you can actually, by using this trick, you can apply classical algorithms onto a fluorescent images or different kind of images, and you can get segmentation maps that you need for your model from a different domain. So you basically, you, you take another type of image that is easier to work with than the image you started with. And then you get your labels for your more complicated case. All right, so this is the very the baseline where we started from. Then um, what, yeah, uh, this is just to say that we have published this a couple of times, including uh, myself being the first author and uh, shared first author. And then a student of mine, have, we have been publishing these kind of things. And these were relatively successful. So people use that kind of stuff. And they also ended up, uh, this technology and the network that we have trained this way actually ended up in a product in, in a company. So it's a company that is using it for the real customers. And we have sometimes feedback loop is customers that are unhappy, they come back at us and say, why did you this price or this doesn't work for us? Or something like that. Um, but it's not always uh, easy to find this kind of other domain or other type of image, or it doesn't help. So for example, in here, we are actually looking for something you are not able to capture that well. And these are basically so-called artifacts. So you can, uh, you, you can yourself very clearly see what I mean, right? Because these are kind of striking. These are uh, looking weird. Uh, what we are actually looking for is these kind of objects. But yet they're very hard to get using, let's say, classical approaches and there are multiple other uh, uh, applications for this. Think about cancer from CT scans. Cancer is an anomaly, something that doesn't look like your normal organ, right? So it's not something, it's something off the limit, off the normal. And there are multiple other things, it's called anomaly detection. And uh, what we did here was that we uh, taken those images, right, of the images, 
We have also provided uh, image level uh, labels saying that yes, this image has an anomaly and this one doesn't have an anomaly or artifact or doesn't have an artifact. We fed it into a framework called Scorecamp framework which basically just opens up the classification models that train to say whether this image has an anomaly or doesn't have an anomaly. We visualize probability maps, the initial probability maps. We binarize them, we get initial uh, segmentation performance, and then we fed these into our strongly supervised framework that we normally, that we, we kind of used to work with, and it turned out to produce very good results. So we started off having no pixel labels whatsoever, not being able to say whether the artifacts are the images, and just saying, yes, this one seems to have one, this one doesn't seem to have one, and yet we ended up having pretty good segmentation as a result of this. Uh, this has been under review for some time, uh, so uh, some of our uh, people from the research group have been uh, writing this paper, hopefully being submitted and uh, sorry, being successfully accepted to scientific reports. We're still waiting for the response, and and uh, this is just to give you a flavor. Uh, it's a, just a side note uh, slide. So this is how the artifacts look inside. Why we are interested in artifacts is that inside the artifact, it's very hard to find nuclei because they kind of block the light. You can't see through it. That's why we are interested in to find it and actually remove it from the analysis. Um, kind of going forward a little bit with this is to say that um, other things have been done. So people did some uh, cool stuff uh, regarding how to kind of reduce the need for the training data for the labeling. In case you still want to get some labels, but you want to get fewer of them, then people have used something called transfer learning, and that's been quite uh, known across the board. So you, for example, you have a network that is capable of finding pedestrians on the images, and it turned out you can actually do the same, or you can transfer that model to cells, and you might have less uh, a need for less images for the cell finding model. So it's called positive transfer, or transfer learning, and it turned out to be relatively successful, so people dwelled on it. And what happened was that they figured out that the better pretext, and this kind of finding uh, uh, pedestrians seem to be, so this kind of task seem to be um, important. The way how you find it, the, the way what you do is important. So people have been doing different things, for example, reconstructing the same image from the input image, or let's say reconstructing 10 pixel shifted part of the image to kind of get, give a model of flavor of the problem that is going to to be dealing with. There are, um, to be honest, so I just wanted to bring this up, this is called self-supervised learning, self-supervised self pre-training, is to find a pretext seems to be relatively complicated, um, and juries out uh, to figure out which kind of pretext seems to be working for, uh, for which kind of problems. Uh, so we are, by the way, doing this research right now. And, um, well, uh, leading towards this is the idea of completely deliberating ourselves from the need of label data. So, of idea of unsupervised learning, completely unsupervised segmentation. Why not, right? So where we started with this is that we generated a pseudo mass, so as a starting point using a Laplacian filter and some simple algorithms, so we get, get something like that. Then you feed those kind of pseudo mass into UNET model and use it as a target, initial target. Then you get a bunch of outputs you threshold them at different levels of the probabilities, and then you use the one, let's say you try to assess the one that has the best kind of um, information retained about your original image. That, that's the most complicated part. And let's say you're, you're fixing one of them as a next new target for the model, and you do it iteratively until you uh, end up having something that looks reasonable. And Obviously, one problem here, this is called uh, unsupervised learning, by the way. Uh, one problem here is that uh, finding this kind of function to optimize the best looking image in this process is complicated, and we ended up uh, not having it. But still, I think the, the idea is interesting, and it's, it's still worth exploring. Um, so since, since this is a seminar, I decided to kind of pull it up. Um, yeah, and after battling with unsupervised learning, we come to appreciate a little bit the value of uh, self-labeling, so labeling by our own hands, uh, looking
looking into these things, for example, uh, complicated images like that being labeled in Label Studio. Uh, we were actually able to train our models on relatively few images. For example, this is a model that was trained on one training image. Um, this is the model trained on four images, eight images, and 16 images. And after that, actually adding more images, this did not really change much. So actually, the takeaway is that you don't really need, uh, you don't really need too many images to make relatively good performance. And it seems to be quite valuable and, and producing nice results. So that, that is something to take away with us. Um, I, I guess one of the final things I wanted to show is that when you do self-labeling, so when you actually create your own masks yourself with your hands, then it doesn't really, it doesn't really need to be perfect. For example, Alexander here has um, worked on an experiment where we have randomly uh, just removed some of the nuclei from the mass, from the segmentation mass, so something you train against. And then it turned out that if you do it randomly, then your model, sorry, your model is still going to produce relatively good segmentation. Even if you remove as many as, let's say, 50% of your um, objects from the segmentation, it can still work relatively, relatively well. And, and this has been uh, quite surprising even for more complex images like Breitfeld images, so this is a Breitfeld image, and that even for these very complex images with half of your annotations, you might end up, end up having nice or reasonable results. The same has been looked at uh, under uh, histology slides, so these are different kinds of images as you can see, and this was about object detection, so these green boxes are objects, and basically, this is the ground truth. The, the left side is the ground truth, then the model that was trained on 100% of the data, and then the model that was trained on 50% of the data. And they're very close in terms of how well the models perform. So I guess one of the takeaways here is that you really don't need that much, or it feels that you don't need that much to get relatively good performance after you label it yourself. So that was our kind of five stages of the denial uh, regarding the manual segmentation. So we started off saying, of course, we are not going to, you know, uh, of course, we are going to train our models with small data. Then we went to, to kind of swing saying that, oh, this can't be that hard when we face the problems with unsupervised learning that didn't work. Then we were asking ourselves whether we're really going to label our own data. Um, and, and yeah, so all the way to, up to acceptance and saying, well, it actually seems to be pretty good and also we don't waste so much time and we learn about the data and we don't need it to be perfect. So it seems to be a, a good thing. And um, yeah, so that is uh, very closely, and um, I don't know how much uh, time I have left, I guess pretty much okay. So this is about the, the team that has worked on this. Um, um, this is the uh, biomedical imaging group here, um, and I'm, I'm happy to receive questions. I'm happy to elaborate. I think I was a little bit too fast on some of the things. I'm happy to receive questions and get back to the discussion part. Um, that is all from my side. I also had uh, some images from the examples of the bright Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to answer. I was with Russian. Should I, as a moderator, ask myself, oh, that was a nice discussion. <laughs> that was a nice slide. <laughs> Introductory question. Introductory question. Well, I, I guess I'm, um, since that was not so, uh, can we go back to my slides, by the way? So that I, I, I'd like uh, to see a tiny of course on the slide, but I could go back and elaborate a little bit. Um, so, I guess one of the, Kind of, I'm, I'm, what I'm not trying to say is that you definitely need to label all your data because not always it's feasible, but what I was trying to say is that we started off with this hypothesis that you should not, as a computer scientist, this is definitely below your kind of qualification to do this kind of things, but then we figured that some of this can actually help. So um, labeling some of the data makes sense. Uh, uh, is, oh, go ahead, I think. Should we have a microphone, by the way, we have five minutes and... Um, yeah. Need a microphone or not? Yeah, I think we do. I think so. Because, yeah, 
we put you for the people who are going to listen and to the, uh, the recording, the recording yes. that uh, makes sense. Uh, okay, uh, I have a question about uh, does it make sense to sometimes do kind of partial labeling or just kind of inactive learning style uh, so the model would actually request some parts of the image to be labeled because that's particularly where it is most uncertain. Yeah, that was uh, uh, some research that at least I've come across that people label things smartly in a sense that you look at the places or the model suggests that I'm most uncertain in these places and that it can provide um, pixels, even not object-wise performance, but pixel, it seems to improve quite a bit. So you can cut on the time spent on labeling quite drastically by listening to the model's mistakes and, and yeah, figuring this kind of thing out. I'm actually having this uh, idea on the back of my mind and actually uh, looking for somebody to uh, uh, get in touch with me regarding the project. So thank you for bringing this up. By the way, I had my email uh, there, so if you are interested in that kind of stuff, then uh, please let me know. Um, thank you, Dima. Very interesting uh, discussion. Somebody said it. Thank you. <laughs> so, even from the technical side, like from the ecosystem of where we did it, to, um, you know, this bit of uh, study have a lot of privacy preserved. Um, you may be familiar with the, my recent work of creating there. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we bring these two giant uh, boards together where we can maintain the privacy of the data set? Maybe some institutes don't like to share their um, patient um, data set, but using the working data we can understand. Yeah, I, I, uh, so I, I, my idea is a little bit uh, maybe towards the side that I wish we wouldn't have to, but it seems that we will uh, use the federated learning because although, so these cell lines are more or less public. So Kila, if you have heard about Henrietta Lex, unfortunately public because it was actually taken from the patient without her consent, but that was done in the 50s when it was a, a normal practice to take off stuff and never tell anyone with that you did that. Uh, but all these cell lines are more or less public um, in, a, in a public space, so these are not protected in that sense, but a lot of this research is related to, at least my research is related to cancer and CD scans, and this is where the privacy kicks in so hard because people don't want their scans to fly around Europe, they prefer them to be in one place. Um, so that is definitely uh, something we have been looking at. I actually myself have been looking at, and I'm, I'm not good at that, so that we'll pretty much sure we'll have to talk in the future and, and uh, see how much we can uh, deal with that. I, so I know that people work on these problems and actually train models in federated learning and, and you yourself and other people have been you know, training segmentation performance models. Yeah, definitely. Uh, transparent learning, reinforcement learning, like a lot of those studies. Yeah, 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 yeah. makes sense. Yeah, cool, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. There's one person here. Um, should I give my microphone? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm still wondering uh, why it works. Uh, did you use any special uh, talents loss to make it work? Or? No, I, I actually have a very good, I, I, I hope I have a good answer to this. I, I think I understand why it works. The reason why it works is that it's random. You kind of you kind of trick the model because it never knows which one you have extracted and which one it didn't you didn't extract. So it basically forced you to segment all of them because it doesn't know. And uh, as long as you are keeping that random stuff, so if you're not making any bias mistake, it's going to be working fine. If you are making bias mistake, let's say you are only removing stuff from half of the image and you're leaving everything else on the on the next half of the image, you're doomed. It's going to be like that. It's going to be half half. Um, so it's randomness that happens. So it's like a regulatory parallelization effect. Yeah, it is. It is like a regularization effect. Although, if you really do it hard, you can see on the last one here, it's going to be super tough regularization. So it's going to be. But yeah, and on the other hand, it's a, it's a nice regularization. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you. You can also uh, you can also do shifting, and you can also do noising. Uh, uh, here um, we have another okay. question. What? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, thanks for the. Uh, oh, uh, can you go back to this uh, complete unsupervised? Yeah. Like, sure. Oh wait. Sorry. So look, I'm at here, right? Yes. So sure. um, do you think it would be possible to? choose these new train targets based on some downstream parameter. For example, we expect the confluency to be 50% uh, for whatever reason, because cells were growing for a particular number of hours, for example, and then you kind of know what, uh, what confluency you expect, and this confluency should translate to the percentage of pixels in the uh, positive class, for example, and then you could just have uh, time lapse of uh, different confluences, and then you would expect to recreate the same final uh, distribution or uh, resultant data, and uh, then use this as the target instead of uh, use image based uh, labels, for example. Yeah, I think it is possible. Um, I'm just one worry here is that the network is going to optimize that number and not going to really look for cells. You, you might get this number, or, or I imagine you can get this number without the model actually finding the cells. You can get something that will look like model is just trying to optimize this value without really looking for cells. This is something that I, another problem with this approach is that it, it, it's, it is very, Lack of direction for the model. It doesn't know what it does in a sense. So it kind of, it kind of optimizes stuff, but but yeah. So you need to really have a prop propagation step in, in that sense. So you could, um, it is jumping too much. Let's say it's very unstable. That that is the problem with this stuff. Can I follow up? So uh, probably you wouldn't have to start from zero. You could do what is done right now. And yeah. To have it do something reasonable guide it and then it may level out it's weird uh, something like that. Could be, could be. In our case, since we used image based stuff, it didn't stop jumping. It was still kind of very unstable. But maybe using something else as an optimization something could be. I think uh, I'm done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi everyone, my name is Tanya. I work with Autodata and
the Python threshold is that uh, this is right, so maybe this is a cloud, and maybe this is not really right, so maybe this is a semi transparent cloud, or maybe it's just clear, or maybe it's not. But actually, it works quite in a strange way, sometimes not really well, because you kind of can't apply the same threshold for all cases. Uh, but the examples of this is AppMask, uh, Centerfor, uh, Centerfor is currently used uh, by European space agencies, so they get the sensing that they, they apply Centerfor and then it goes for further uh, processing. Uh, yeah, there's CityFix and Maya, uh, but there's also machine learning approaches, so that starts from random forest, UNET, ResNet, and everything else, so basically just applying something, some algorithm on the data, getting cloudless. Uh, and the example is uh, as to cloudless, yes, but the main problems with this approach is that sometimes they just don't have cloud shadow detection, it's not very nice because like, how would cloud shadow is better than cloud when you need data. Uh, then they really inaccurate in a serious or semi-transparent cloud detection, which is also creates some problems, and they also computationally expensive to run. For example, we were really struggling with Maya. It creates like 200 gigabytes of temporary files, and it takes two hours to run it just in one centimeter product. Uh, yeah, so we looked at that, and we were like, "Yay! Let's create our own most accurate and free AI-based cloud mask processor." So really ambitious, really ambitious. So, but what exactly did we want? We wanted to detect clouds, semi-transparent clouds, cloud shadows, and clear areas. We wanted to be accurate. We wanted to be to produce masks to be 10 meter resolution as global as possible. So we wanted to detect clouds in Sahara, we wanted to detect, to detect clouds in Antarctica and in Europe, everywhere. And fast speed because of, we just need fast calm detection. And we wanted to make users happy. But how would we go for that? How we would do that? Oh, we need something. First of all, we need some data set uh, that would contain all the classes we wanted. So, uh, cloud, semi transparent cloud, cloud shadow, a clear area. So, we also wanted the data to be from different parts of the earth, from different seasons winter, spring, summer, autumn. And the other thing, of course, is to choose appropriate model for that. So trying, trying to find the best performance model, and that also we wanted it to be fast, as I said. And firstly, let's start with the model. So we did a lot of research. We looked at UNET, we looked at ResNet, we looked at all the semantic computation models, and we found out that the TFLAG uh, version 3 plus. So, this is what exactly what we wanted. There are some reasons for that, and one of these is address convolution that just like allow you to get larger contacts by just using the same number of parameters. Then address special py uh, pyramid pooling. Again, uh, we can do multi-scale detection, but again with address convolutions. And well, it just does a lot of praise in many research papers, so we decided to use it, and eventually. What we uh, end, up, uh, end up with it was a model that would expect as an input to these images with certain channels and the size of images uh, 512 by 512. I will explain later why. And the output shape will be width by height by number of classes, which is six. And we eventually got number of parameters, which is around 25,000. Yeah, so let's now remember that we have deep cloud. Uh, is our cloud detector. What do we do next? Then we were like, okay, well, amazing. Now we have model. What do we need? We need data. And what we started to do first, it was of course looking at the available data set, uh, data set in the cloud, Sentinel 2 cloud mask catalog. It has cloud mask resolution is 20 meters, and we want to 10. And with the classes of each pixel could be of the class clear, shadow, or cloud. Uh, yes. So what we did with it, at first we sampled it and split it into 512 by 512. Then we gave it to our deep lab. Yeah, by the way, we trained it with the dice one because we built it by categorical percentage, but it was 
really imbalanced data set that kind of didn't work. Um, and then boom, they got an initial model. Amazing. Now we have an initial model. What do we do next? What uh, we wanted to do, we wanted to create our own data set. Uh, and okay, how do we do that? We decided to answer the question how to make users happy. And from this, we would want to know what they actually want. So we looked at the Copernicus uh, Open Hub uh, report. It's from a download data. And you can see this is the interest. It's a download statistics. And you can see that the users are mostly interested in Europe. It's the most reddest area there. Uh, they're not really interested in North Africa. Uh, yeah, so based on this, we created some data distribution and yeah, of course, it was important also to look at seasonal information. They, were, they weren't really interested in winter because like, you can't really get any information. You have so many clouds and then, yeah, and you don't really have some crops growing. Um, yeah, but spring, autumn, and summer, they were really uh, equally interesting for users. Well, okay. Then we, what we did, we downloaded 20 of data from the most interesting places for users. And, one, and we resampled each band to a 10 meter resolution. We got a huge, huge, huge image, 11,000 pixels by 11,000 pixels. And uh, well, we can't in the two model. So we split it between 512 by 512. And this is from where 512 is coming from. Uh, yeah, OK. Now we have available split styles. What's next? We already trained the initial, uh, initial model on this publicly available data set. And what we did, we giving the styles to the initial model, which gives prediction. And then our, I call it, label detective looking at these predictions and like, this sucks. But what sucks go to our artists who are, <laughs> who are labelers, they label this. And this go to our data set, which we'll later use to fine tune our model. And this is called the active learning. So this is what we are using. So basically, by doing this, we just uh, don't label everything because like not labeling everything won't help. You need to have useful data for the model. But yeah, as Dima said, this is not that that you need like a lot of model, a lot of data. You need good data for the most important for the to, to learn for the model. Okay, and eventually we got something like this. So we Still, by the way, it's a going project where we still a lot of, have a lot of labels. You can see in our frame size, there is not really a virus covered. So there is some Canada, some China area, uh, some Africa. And this is our test set. Oh, this is train set and test set, not test set. So, uh, yes, uh, you can see that in our test set, we have um, quite distributed data so we can check how much is from in Sahara, in Australia, like and everywhere and that's this we can make a real conclusion if it works or not really. Um, so let's look at some results. So here you can see first column is label, the second column column is the true color image and the third one is prediction. So yeah blue color is clouds, yellow is semi transparent and Clear is purple and green is shadow. So you can see that it performs quite well, even in those strange fields that look like circles. This is also America, by the way, and this uh, other field on the lower uh, on the lower pictures. Also, we have examples from the desert, it's a second row. So you can see the kind of perform there. Also, quite okay. Overestimated shadow bit by what that happened. And yeah, seems good, but never think about that. But of course, we have some problems. And the first problem is detecting shadow on the water. Well, it basically just doesn't happen. It does not detect the shadow of the water. This is, can be really explained by the fact that we have only 1% of the shadows in our data set. Yeah, because actually, they just don't occur that often. So this is the problem. Um, there's one more example. So again, you can see that water, no shadows detected again. 
yes, but this was like a relatively steep and then the same kind of thing because the earth is so different, the landscape is so different and to get more the really generalized on everything is quite a challenging thing. Um, and another, another challenge we have is snow. What happens when we have cloud and snow? So this is true color image. And you will be like, oh, well, how labels label that? But in addition to true color image, we also provided one A. So they here put the, uh, it's a near infrared uh, uh, band. So here they could look and be like, oh, not really. But we didn't see cloud here. So we will say that this is clear. Model, however, so cloud, and said that there are some clouds there. Um, yeah. So it's quite often happened that clouds seem to look like snow, or snow seems to look like a cloud, and this creates a lot of confusion uh, for the model. Yeah, and one more. It's uh, really interesting because this is a true example. This is from our data that this can happen too. So we have true social color images. And the labelers, we have some people who label that, and one of them said that, well, the first image is clear, so there is no cloud, and the second is semi transparent. And this is a question how do you define semi transparent? Because this is not really obvious. Um, yeah, so if to summarize that, it's the, the biggest challenges that we, challenge that we faced, it was. Uh, but the world is too big, so it is a challenge we can't solve it, but, well, yes. And labeling can be confusing uh, and time-consuming, as you can see, uh, as you can see some, yeah, some, it depends how you define semi-transparent, sometimes adding plant A doesn't really help to see snow or clouds. Um, sometimes you look at the picture and like, is it a shadow or is it a lake? So this is really, really important to have some guidelines you know how so that there should be consistency in the data and um, yeah data debugging and by this I mean well if things like this happen you need to look through the data set before putting this into model because then you will learn some strange things oh no uh, like it actually happened that it was really confused sometimes it's, it's like misclassified the pictures like this and it was clear it was semi-transparent or semi-transparent that it was clear, so there should be some consistency in data, that's why it's quite important to look through it before depositing it in your data set. Um, yes, so how, did, how, did, uh, how could we improve, improve our model? Well, adding more data, this, uh, we won't solve the problem, the world is too big, but we can help with it. Uh, and then improve labeling process, and by this I mean well, first, what we can do, we can speed it up somehow, and there was, the, there was an idea to firstly give the unlabeled picture to the model, and then our labels would not scratch, or not uh, label them from the scratch, but they just fix the uh, predictions, so then they would get labeled. Uh, yes, and of course, the other could be just to add all bands, so all of these certain bands for labelers so then they could see really for each brand if there is a semi-transparent, if there is a cloud, if there is snow. Yes, and then from now, thank you very much. And do you have any questions? I will use an opportunity while people make their minds. Um, so when you were saying about the active learning component and you were showing the detective, um, which looked like yourself, right? Okay. So what is this detective and how does the de detective know if the label is crap? You can see it. If you just look at this and you're like, Jesus. Wait, so it's a manual? Yes, it is. Okay. Because first there can be like, you can of course look at all the viewers that are already simply followed by not looking at all the somehow okay. But yeah, you can just do that. Right. So there is a human who is just at the thing, I think. But. All right. Uh, by the way, just one note is that when you show this uh, image of snow and then some kind of infrared or whatever, then your model predictions are actually nicely looking like this infrared picture. That's just like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
I have a question. So, the view with image patches, uh, did you notice any difference between the segmenting between the center of the patches or engages? Like, the question is, is how important is the context if you want to classify the clouds? Uh, well, actually, we didn't notice, uh, notice the difference, but the context, uh, context is quite important when you label, because sometimes you label and then you know, you know if it's a snow, but boom, you add one more tile next to it, and you're like, now I know. So this is how, but no, most of the clouds equally on the edges and the center. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Can I ask three questions? Okay, so the first is uh, about this um, user preference. So, are you sure that people are not interested in winter rather than they already know that it's so hopeless that, and so that there are so many clouds that are actually not downloading the data, but in reality they would like to have uh, winter images even if it has 70% Cloud, but they would still like to do something which is 30%. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your question. So, we use these uh, web points with download statistics, which says that uh, yeah, winter is not really interesting, and this is not information by the European press agency. But uh, I, I understand your point. Uh, and usually, uh, many applications that is in the third situation is mostly about like crop classification and mostly what is happening like in the, in the country in which hot fields. Of course, it's also like, uh, sometimes it's building detection, drone detection, uh, yeah, but, well, based on great words, winter is not really interesting for users. Okay, thanks. So the second question is about uh, physics. So if uh, clouds create the shadows and you know the meta information from Sentinel-2, so you know the sun azimuth, you know it's on sun synchronous orbit and so on, then could you calculate where the shadow should be based on the location of the cloud and classification of the cloud type? You would know how high it is and then could you automate the generation of shadow segmentations based on this sort of physics informed logic? This is what rule-based approaches actually do but it's uh, the cloud detection when you like you know you have some numbers in your head i also want to detect clouds in a secret building yeah detect cloud for me uh and it takes much more time so this is the main problem uh and well and the other thing we really wanted to make our couple mask is fully like just keep learning pace so that's why we don't do that yes but you could use it to generate masks and then fix it they don't need to be in the end, they can just sort of use it for training. Uh, and the third question is about um, using media and images. So Sentinel produces quite a lot of images. I think it creates like one image every 10 days or even more often. So what if you took uh, images from several different years or several different weeks and just took the media of each pixel, will you end up with cloud free images, and then you could sort of use this information to get more clean masks, for example, or uh, use this sort of thing because the underlying uh, countryside may not be changing that much, I imagine, compared to having cloud over here. I'm really, I'm not really sure that I fully understand your question, so you suggest you take. Same location and images from the week, and week before that week, week before that week, before that week, and then use this. Yes, so basically, basically you're saying that on average there is no cloud, and then you could get a ton of uh, clear pixels based on that without any manual labeling. Or maybe there are some areas that are so cloudy that you would obtain a ton of cloud masks. Yeah, but let's, let's say, for example, Estonia, autumn. Well, there is just one cloud forever, and you can't really get any other things. So, but if you have only clouds in not clear areas, then it can be also be considered for the model. Thank you. Any 
more questions? So it's kind of a continuation of this question about uh, augmenting whole data. Like, uh, could you say for clouds, you can see them from top, but you can also see them from bottom. Could from you, like from bottom, you, uh, for the camera, and is, is there a way to kind of augment your labeling process with some other kind of data sources? Like, is it suggested to take physics as a augmenting some data, or is, is there work in that sense as well that you want to label, but to use different sources and then you kind of uh, learn the matching or the registration process and you learn the uh, matching? Would that be done in some sense? Oh, uh, so it's a, it's a so for, yeah. Yeah, for clouds, it's like I can say that you can take the camera at some place from the bottom and you have a sphere of where you're looking at the clouds from the bottom. So, and then you have some images from the top. Of course, there is a registration problem of how to register those two images. But could there be other such things like weather and some other data that you could use to sort of uh, support the problem that you have in the first place? Well, I actually don't really think so because it sounds like the goal of the project. So it that would be really nice if at some point half of us could replace sensor core <laughs> then then uh, then but the thing that is used there is on the pens and you need to somehow learn it from there that this is a problem, this is not a problem. Uh, I hope everyone's back. Uh, microphone is still working. I guess. I hope. <laughs> so uh, hi, I'm Marcus. I'm a PhD student from University of Tartu. And uh, my main topic or research area is machine learning. Uh, and uh, more precisely, uncertainty estimation, uh, calibration, checking how well uh, uh, probabilities are calibrated, and so on. Uh, but uh, to this uh, presentation, so calibration. Of first I view semantic segmentation. Uh, and uh, it's the structure is twofold. First I talk about wiring. This is a semantic segmentation model, uh, which gives output in first I view. So first presenter Pima talked about cells, uh, Tanya talked about the clouds. So this is something in between them, not that close, not that far away. Uh, and the second part is uh, probability calibration of uh, this uh, model's output, semantic segmentation. Uh, so let's get into the model. It was proposed uh, last year, 2021, in uh, uh, International Conference of Computer Vision. And uh, main author is Anthony Hugh and uh, colleagues, and also uh, the group. Uh, I guess led by, might not, but uh, Alex Kendall is in the group. So, fun fact, uh, he was presenting a couple of years ago in, in the similar event in data science seminar. And uh, th this group is uh, mainly in uh, WAVE, and uh, WAVE is working uh, yeah, in autonomous driving wheel. So, the inputs of the model this is our six camera images around the vehicle, so front, back, left, right, uh, and these are located something like that. So there are more images from the left and right, but uh, the video views and everything, this is uh, the inputs uh, and overlaps and everything is taken care of, uh, the model takes care of that. And actually the model takes uh, in uh, several time frames, and uh, in this data set it takes two fast time frames, and based on one current time frame, it predicts the semantic segmentation and also it's able to predict the future so the time frames. Uh, so the output uh, bigger, uh, in the bigger on the left, uh, there is the uh, row view. The row view is not outputted by the model, so it's just added uh, later. Uh, the black triangle is the uh, ego vehicle. So this is the vehicle that has the cameras and uh, does the calculations and everything. 
and around there are several colorful blobs and these blobs are uh, segmentations of vehicles so in the further view, top down view and uh, the transparent lines in front of uh, the vehicle or colorful blobs, vehicle segmentations are the trajectories of the vehicles uh, and the, uh, on the right is a uh, serves the distribution of the VHFs. So the model can uh, give uh, uh, several samples of the VHF and you can see which uh, are more likely, so the brighter lines and then uh, these are less likely. So the model can actually uh, argue or uh, reason about uh, different features, different transistors, which the other videos might make. So let's look into this example uh, in the middle of there. There, uh, I highlighted this, uh, uh, this is purple, purple vehicle, and it's going straight at the moment. But uh, when it starts turning, the model uh, uh, starts to predict different outcomes. So it might go a little bit to the uh, right or just make there, and so on, uh, until uh, the model or the vehicle is uh, taking the lane, then it's okay. This is uh, probably going to this lane and uh, uh, and uh, then again if there are a couple of lanes then it might switch the lanes. So this uh, final output is actually consisting four, it's made out of four different outputs. Centerness, so the center of different uh, segmentations, uh, segmentation, offset and future flow. And uh, this uh, uh, final output is put together based on this, uh, centeredness, offset, and offset. So this uh, uh, make getting the different instances out of the segmentations and uh, separated these space is done based on that. Uh, so let's get to the architecture, uh, starting with this uh, input uh, time frames, time steps, and images. These are uh, encoded. And then uh, these switches are linked to 3D. Uh, this uh, 3D uh, projection or 3D features are then projected into bird's eye view, top down view, and uh, also this uh, echo motion, this uh, A1 to AD minus 1, it is taken into account, into account because this uh, vehicle is moving also, so this mo motion is cancelled out. Uh, then the model can uh, reason about st st static and uh, moving uh, objects together. Uh, and this is input into the temporal model, which is a, a convolutional network and uh, it's a spatial transformer. And this model has uh, then uh, outputs a state, which is uh, inputted into the decoder network, and this decoder network outputs four different uh, outputs. Like, like I said before, centeredness, segmentation, offset, and future flow. Uh, now let's get into the future predictions. So for the future prediction, there is this uh, green model, the number Y model, uh, and uh, this is a recurrent neural network, which is uh, predicting, uh, based on this uh, state ST, it's predicting uh, ST plus one. And also it uses uh, latent variables Eta as an input, and uh, it's uh, done recursively. So basically, first it uh, gets the state st plus one predicted, and this state is then used to predict st plus two, and so on. And there is one extra part there: all these uh, latent variables are uh, calculated. So this ETAs, and this is uh, using some present and future distribution, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So what I did here is uh, uh, I retrained the model on vehicles first. So, but it was only done on vehicles uh, in this uh, proposed paper. So I thought, okay, it uh, might be useful to try to do it on pedestrians as well. Uh, vehicles are quite big, pedestrians are Lot of small, lot smaller. So I want to try out how it works there, and uh, how well this is carried. So if you zoom into to the image, we can see this is isn't very high resolution. It's 
is it, it is uh, divided uh, 24 times uh, 480, and uh, you can use very big images, otherwise the model will get uh, slower. At the moment, it's uh, one to two seconds uh, per uh, uh, each time frame or per uh, iteration. And uh, yeah, looking into the other one, it's uh, yeah, it's not that uh, bad, but it's not that uh, good as well. So. Uh, no, I highlighted some uh, parts where pedestrians are. So I colored them differently, and uh, on the right there are the predicted segmentation. So the darker it is, the more probable model thinks that there is a uh, there is a pedestrian. And this blue rectangle is the error window. And uh, this is the ground truth segmentation, and you can see it's uh, overlapping quite well. There are some uh, pedestrians missing, but uh, this, uh, from this image, uh, it's really hard to see even for me. So it's not not uh, bad. And uh, there is this uh, hypothetical uh, road that I drew there, so it's easy to imagine where these pedestrians are. And then I also highlighted this here. And the interesting thing you might have noticed already is that I uh, this red circle is actually highlighting car, and this model and ground truth has it predicted. And uh, however, it should predict the pedestrians. And the reason behind this, that is actually there is pedestrian behind this car, and as the model is using uh, fast time steps, it can uh, let's call it remember that the pedestrian is there, and if car drives in front of the pedestrian. Uh, the destination just gone, the model still uh, outputs that, okay, there is likely the destination still there. Okay, and the motivation why to use this kind of model, so it's uh, relatively, uh, or it's easier to do this bird's eye view, or planning from bird's eye view than in 3D environments. Uh, there we can see this moving stat static uh, objects uh, based on this trajectories. Uh, using this segmentation, uh, it, it can use uh, more post-map calculation, but uh, this uh, segmentation might need calibration. So, and uh, for example, if this in post-map, there one probability is uh, uncalibrated probability is uh, three times smaller than calibrated probability uh, in case of the planning model or going to this going to the planning model might have some costly uh, costly problems or it, it just might get into accident or there might be some uh, yeah, planning issues there. Uh, so and uh, oh, we did this calibration, we did it in pixel by uh, manner, meaning this uh, each uh, segmented pixel is a uh, separate uh, prediction. In total it has two hundred times two hundred pixels but uh, and each pixel is uh, uh, altimeter times altimeter in size, uh, but we chose the area in front as it's the most important uh, for the safety. So it's uh, 45 times 60 meters. Uh, and uh, getting to this uh, uh, semantic uh, segmentation and uh, calibration of that. So here is on re uncalibrated reliability diagram. And uh, in each pin, there is 20 pins. In each pin, there is uh, this uh, predicted uh, probabilities for uh, segmentation bits. Uh, so let's select one pin, uh, starting from 0 0.6 uh, to 0 0.65 probability. And uh, here, we, here we want this pin to actually be close to the diagonal. Then it's very calibrated. But uh, we can see it's uh, the model of the sober confident. The, Probability should be between 0 0.6 to 0 0.5, but it's uh, around 0 0.4 uh, when we set the ground truth labels. So it's it's uh, uh, overestimating, but uh, it's uh, it's not a bad overestimate because uh, then uh, the, the the then the planning model can still see that okay there might be better there, but uh, uh, more likely there isn't, so it, it isn't a fact. But uh, 
uh, in this case, actually, most of the instances are in this worst, very smart thing now. Uh, but uh, th that's the uh, or reason of that is uh, because, uh, as you get, uh, as you saw from this uh, segmentation, most of the area was white, so very low probability, and only some uh, small black dots. So most of this segmentation uh, probabilities are really low. So let's uh, check into this uh, bin. And uh, we log scale bin, and uh, now checking into this uh, first bin, we can see actually this is uh, underestimating these probabilities. Uh, these probabilities are really small, uh, 10 to the power of minus y, for example, like say, uh, check that bin, we can see this. Uh, Actually, it should be around 10 to the power minus 4, which is 10 times difference, which is a uh, rather, rather big difference. Uh, and uh, checking to the futures, uh, we can see these uh, uh, things are getting the, below the uh, diagonal. And uh, then it's starting to be overconfident again, or overestimating these probabilities again. Uh, uh, let me get back, actually. So the futures, uh, this uh, each time frame is uh, 0 0.5 seconds. So there are uh, 0 0.5, 1 second, and 1.5 seconds. So this is the time steps that are uh, this uh, data set has, or this uh, yeah, time rates are generated. Uh, getting to the calibration, so uncalibrated uh, as uh, this kind of reliability diagram. Uh, then uh, very widely used uh, density scaling, it uh, doesn't improve that much the uh, uncalibrated result, or, and it might be because everything is in one bin and it not, might not be able to calibrate that well. However, using isotonic regression, it uh, is doing uh, rather well. And also looking into the EC, EC is expected calibration error, and it pretty much says how much these uh, beans are off from the diagonal. So, simply said. And here we can see that isotonic has a uh, much better EC and also lowers a little bit the uh, negative log loss. Uh, so, to the conclusions, theory is a great semantics implementation model. Uh, I didn't really say how great it was, <laughs> but uh, uh, for we could see that. Uh, uh, 60 of intersection of uh, union, so uh, but for pedestrians it was three times smaller, uh, so it's doing rather well. But uh, looking into quality data, just uh, looking into how well it's doing and checking the graphs, so it's uh, yeah, it's doing quite well. Uh, but it's not pixelized calibrated, and in this case, uh, this uh, isotonic regression is uh, best at calibrating that. And uh, in, for future work, uh, I want us to do check object-wise calibration, not only pixel-wise, and region-wise, so to check some area in front of the vehicle, uh, like in uh, 10 meter blocks or whatever, something like that. And uh, that's it from me. Thanks for listening, and questions are welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, while audience uh, makes their minds about questions, I, I believe there will be plenty. I just want to, um, I wanted to ask about how close we are from you using this on ADL car and, you know, actually seeing scenes of how to predict it. Um, because we also have a very good setup with the media cameras. I'm just thinking yeah. here. Uh, we have been planning that. Current problem with this model is it's not uh, fast enough for real time uh, uh, calculations. But uh, we can make this model a little bit smaller. At the moment, it's uh, 100 meters times 100 meters uh, range. But uh, for safety, we, like I said, we are more uh, interested in this area in front, maybe a little bit in the back and uh, to the left and right. But uh, that way we could make the model faster and maybe also use some other tricks. But yeah, we have thought also about uh, 
using it on our own ADL module or ADL car, what for the car, ADL yes. car. Yeah, yeah. Right. so it's seeking as a question. Should it work now? Thanks, uh, really interesting. So I was wondering how this bird's eye model would deal with weird cases, so, and dramatic cases, so let's say pedestrian is under the car or on top of the car, which might be quite common uh, during car accidents. And then when you look at it uh, with, with camera, you can see that they're occupying the same uh, spatial region from the bird's eye, but in bird's eye, in segmenting, Segmentation, you have to decide what what the task is, right? You have only one option. We do need to add specific classes for pedestrian under the car, pedestrian on top of the car, two cars having crashed, or something like that. Or are there any other options to deal with these kinds of problems? Because I guess if these sort of situations uh, happen, and the predictions are going to be really inaccurate since during an accident everybody's going to act in a different way compared to a normal situation, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, uh, this is your really interesting question. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> mm. So currently this model is uh, uh, binary, so whether there is uh, a pedestrian or a vehicle, uh, but uh, if you do it in multi-class way, then yeah, there would be probability for being there being pedestrian and a car. But uh, yeah, then <laughs> which which one would uh, get higher confidence? Either way, if there is if what whatever object of it, then uh, the most uh, or best thing is to brake or just uh, slow down. And uh, uh, the second part of the question is that. Uh, uh, if there is some uh, uh, like rare or rare uh, occasion like uh, cr crashing and then uh, cars are moving uh, or behaving differently, then yes, this is, I guess this is a problem and uh, it's uh, good to inject something like that into the data set, like this kind of cases. But yeah, uh, for example, I guess yeah in Desta they are trying to find out some more interesting cases, not just the usual driving, but uh, th these cases where something unexpected happens. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Does anyone else? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. It's very nice. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned it's, uh, it's slow, how slow? Uh, current it's uh, one frame per second, so it's uh, it's not very really done. Okay, thank you. And what what keeps the uh, model from predicting two classes at once? Is it uh, the performance or something else? Is the architecture? Uh, it's uh, currently just trained that way. It's uh, one class, but yeah, it, it can be done in multiple uh, manner. But yeah, then uh, yeah, it it will take more time to train for the model. Uh, but yeah. There is, I guess, a limitation for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for asking question. Um, all right. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, so, uh, any thought or future direction towards calibration uh, based on different groups of, of pedestrians, like uh, different sex, uh, different ages, uh, color of skin, uh, basically different categories of pedestrians that could potentially exist and. Uh, basically to achieve maybe in some sense fairness or some objectivity in the context of autonomous driving that would matter. I guess it would be where maybe they call the distance as equal, <laughs> not to like uh, differentiate between these and or between the distance. Maybe maybe I missed the point a little bit, but yeah. For me, it seems like. So the question was, are you planning to calibrate the model with respect to different class? Meaning, uh, obviously, you don't want to, you want to make sure that you're fair to all pedestrians. Mm -hmm. right? But for that sake, you need to say, well, that some pedestrians are different pedestrians. You have, let's say, elderly people, which are maybe, or kids, right? You have kids, which are smaller, they occupy less space, perhaps they're not so well segmented. Let's say, are you willing to uh, perform a separate calibration for kids? Uh, uh, 
uh, it is our, our arguably one of the most protected classes of uh, yeah. pedestrians out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this it can be taken account different classes for calibration. It do it in class wise manner, like for each class different calibration, and uh, also you said these are most protected. I guess this yeah. Uh, planning models will also take into account this uh, kind of uh, or different classes and uh, behavioral uh, uh, prediction models also like if there are uh, kids or elderly people then they move a little bit different or if it's more unexpected elderly probably slower and yes uh, I guess okay I, I hope it's it answers the rest I, I think uh, it's not uh you are not representing the future of autonomous driving, but yes, I, I think it's, it's a good one. Uh, thank you for being awake. It's a big day. It's a long day. Uh, my presentation is not so much, uh, let's say, scientific or technological, but more like an overview and vision of uh, what we are doing and what we are about to do. Uh, I would love that actually you ask questions when you don't understand something, then it would be more dialogue. Because of the recording, I, I guess we have to wait till then. So well, actually, there's no like. I mean, unless we don't know something, and there's somebody with a gun who's going to shoot somebody, um, we can ask questions. Perfect. So whenever you don't understand something, just interfere me. Merlin just looked at me like. You can have my question. Okay. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Then it also helps me, you know. Like then. I, I feel that the uh, message is passing. Uh, this uh, six topics, very quickly. Uh, first, who we are, uh, then a bit uh, what we do right now, then the future plans and uh, finally the options for data science and computer science people to cooperate uh, with our company. So we are Earth Observation Services Company, that means we are extracting the information out of uh, primarily satellite data and uh, helping other companies and uh, researchers to use satellite data better. Uh, we have been now economically active almost exactly five years. We registered uh, our company already in 2015, but we started to operate in May 2017. We are a spin-off of uh, University of Tartu, the Tartu Observatory, which is now the Institute of uh, University of Tartu. And I like to say that we are more a research spin off than a classical startup. But it needed uh, people you can call us startups. I have nothing against this. Um, so we rely a lot on synthetic graphical radar data, which is a type of Earth observation sensor working day and night through the clouds, the data is always there 24-7, and also deep learning, a lot uh, other machine learning methods uh, also. Uh, a lot of our applications are connected with agriculture, uh, but not only. We work also with uh, dense boxes. And yes, and today we are uh, slowly growing of 14 people plus five interns. We have two offices, uh, one in Tartu and the other in Kurasa. Driving office is almost uh, about to be established. We have one uh, remote team member from Berlin, uh, but no office in Berlin yet. And here are some uh, pictures of our company. I always like to say that the uh, greatest asset of our company is always our people. No matter the economic situation, inflation, deflation, uh, crisis, no crisis, boom, the biggest asset is always our people. And in that sense, we are uh, very lucky. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, one of the key things currently working here on this thing called Kappa 1, I will talk about it uh, in a couple of slides a bit longer is basically making the SAR data, say for example Sentinel-1 uh, satellite data, very easy to use for everybody who would like to use it. Uh, the problem with the SAR data is that it's, uh, it involves a lot of pre-processing steps and uh, 
nerds and the physicists and geeks uh, like it, but many business users uh, don't like it. They just want to give me the satellite data. I don't care about the previous. Just show me the latest thing. So we, we want to take this blocker off. And then we work with the farmers and farm management software providers like ERGONO and also agri insurance. And uh, last but not least, where we started is the monitoring for CRIA and other European banking agencies. So in Europe, subsidies are paid for the farmers, and every country there is uh, a so called local CRIA who is checking if the farmers are following the rules eligible for subsidies or not. And now there is a big reform going on in placing the inspectors work as much as possible with search agents. It's a lot of uh, pain and troubles and uh, problem solving. But perhaps it's not as challenging as solving the autonomous driving. But <laughs> there is also uh, things uh, to solve. And this is a graphical illustration of what we do. First, there is this Kappa 1 uh, horizontal. So it is making this SAR data layers very easy to use. And the claim is that a lot of verticals, a lot of business lines will benefit from this radar satellite data if it is really made easy to use over API and WMS layers and so on. And then there are these two horizontals, two verticals, sorry, which are partly overlapping. It's our insurance and uh, paying agencies, the government users. And both the CRIA and the government users and agricultural insurance want to know basically the same thing. They want to know how the farmer is doing. What's the history of uh, the fields? How likely it's going to be paid? And where is the damage there? And uh, how was the crop uh, yield of the certain year or the current year? Uh, why this agriculture is so important for us? Like, we have been telling about it, um, I think, four years by now, five years. And finally, it seems that people are starting to get it more and more. And there are two uh, trends. From, from one hand, the population is still increasing. Uh, six billion, seven billion. Uh, some will say that soon it will be nine billion people around the world. And humans have actually like enormously changed the planet. If you look like how the Earth looked like, uh, even 200 years ago, the traces of uh, mankind were like negative. And now you see like how much we have wiped out all the other species and uh, taking control. This is actually scary. Uh, and on the other hand, yeah, there is this growing population. And then we want to be uh, greener than ever, like taking care of the planet. And this is conflicting the requirements. Like, we want to be green, but we want to have uh, enough food. That means you must have good information uh, to produce the food in a way that you do least harm on the planet. And this underlines the need uh, and value of science to really understand of, uh, what are the consequences of our actions. Uh, then, as this is semantic segmentation, uh, seminar, data science seminar, so how, what is this all connected with uh, data science? So, virtually everything we do, like uh, basically uh, everything what Kappa Zeta does, there is a data science or machine learning there. Uh, I think there isn't any project which doesn't use data science at all. And our approach to this is that it's just practical to use machine learning. <laughs> it's uh, typically, like, in most of the cases, it is the machine learning way is more accurate than uh, trying to do the old school uh, physics based uh, manual models. Even though it can give you satisfaction to understand the physics, uh, but uh, often the way is in, uh, like they perform it either if you set up the machine learning in, in the correct way. There are some examples of Kappa mask of the Tanya presently. Uh, so why it's so important? It's important because whatever you do with optical satellite data, you always want to know if now this pixel is reliably representing the ground or the sea, or it's uh, corrupted by cloud. And here we would like to rather slightly over-segment than under-segment. Because if we like, start with 
trust the pixel, which is actually corrupted, it will make the errors propagate to all of the higher level products. So that's so that's why it's so important. And uh, we decided to do it in a free and open way because we thought that sooner or later somebody will do it in a free and open way anyways. So there are some uh, private cloud masks, some secret uh, accurate cloud masks, but it's very difficult to judge like how good they are because even the accuracy figures are the secrets. <laughs> so we, we look a different way. But obviously also big thanks for European Space Agency for funding our work. So this allows us to serve the humanity. Um, then we do various agricultural models. We, the first stuff we started was mold detection on the time series. We have done crop classification. Now, thanks to Tanya, your work, we have made this crop classification models more universal and better, like more robust on various seasons. And, and then there are also AI models for, for the Sentinel-1 data layers. That we are modeling the biomass and uh, making the strange looking radar image, which is always there, look like optical image uh, with, with the AI model. Uh, some few words about Kappa 1. Uh, so, where this one comes from? One is like ideally one clip for one API command. So, just giving the satellite image, and we guess what are the pre processing steps that most of the users prepare and we apply them. And if there comes some kind of uh, dedicated user with their needs, then he tells us and we will do with the pre processing. And we do professional calibration and thermal noise correction and spectral suppression to make the most out of the radar uh, image. I put professional in the quotation marks because for researchers it's always uh, how can I say an agreement what is professional. For us, professional means uh, doing it uh, by definition and doing it uh, by the book. Uh, uh, how to access it? First, there is a data. Uh, and then there are WMS and WCS layers that you can use in your desktop chairs or web chairs. And you can query your uh, stuff from the API. Uh, you can try it out. Can you do it right now? Or you can help me. Thank you. I hope it works. And we don't have any demonstration. Okay. Go, please, with export it on. Switch off this uh, layers in the right. The top there is this, uh, like two ROMs. Uh, yeah, you can choose the layers. You can play with the layers. And you can play with tape because actually the last bigger image uh, was like the guy got discovered the full area, which from 18 of them is come to the top, now like bottom left is the calendar, and go to 18 here further. Uh, and switch off like this one. And uh, you can zoom in a bit. VH coherence is a bit strange. Can you go over there? Yes? Or VD coherence? Can you fix it better? It is a coherence layer. I think you can zoom in slightly more. It will be alright. Yeah. So this is one radar area, but it doesn't look like very appealing, but it's a useful tool for the AI model. And, uh, but come to the biomass layer, please. NDVI, SNDVI. Yeah. This one looks nice. Uh, this is more important to that. So this is modeled biomass, both the radar and optical image. NDVI is a very well-known parameter. Uh, everybody was dealing a little bit with optical remote sending knowing. But the problem with it is that it's uh, not available and it's cloudy. So we solved it with, uh, there is some kind of time merging error you can see. <laughs> it's still a bad one. Um, we we solved it with modeling from both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. So from radar data, we can also give the proxy of it, and now giving us input the historical Sentinel-2 image, uh, you can predict how the 
the vegetation index. And we looked at even cloudy conditions. Uh, thank you. Let's go back to the slides. There it is. Uh, some couple of words more about cloud mask. I won't uh, talk a lot about it because Tanya gave a full presentation about it. So, uh, left there is the sentient the input image, and now this. Uh, Cloud areas are depicted here with uh, transparent yellow, and cloud shadows are with, uh, with green. And you can see like the, the middle one is our mask, and the right one is the current ESA mask. And this was where we came to the problem actually. And you can see that our water bodies are misclassified as shadow. Uh, then uh, small fragmented clouds and, and cloud shadows are and all, are also sometimes underestimated. And the wor worst uh, like case that is that when the model uh, underestimates the clouds, it says that the pixel is fine, but actually it isn't. Now more comparison you can uh, see from this page there in the end. Uh, big thanks, Tanya, to you. Uh, also to Margarita who worked on the project before, and greetings for our interns in the back row who are at the moment helping to label the data and uh, make the reference data set uh, better. But we use our uh, like, uh, valuable reference, like labeling source very cleverly using the active learning approach. So labeling only the types which matter the most for the, uh, for the model accuracy. Okay, uh, last but not least, actually there is a crazy idea going on right now and uh, it might uh, well be that in the near future we will start to build a satellite again. Uh, how many of you know S2 is one? How many of you have heard of it? Okay, then great, you, you know what they're talking about. So the, the whole idea is that Sentinel-1 is a great data factor, it's producing global data. And the whole land is uh, imaged several times per week, at least two times per week. And the problem is that it's relatively like uh, sparse or like a relatively weak feature set, just uh, three linearly independent parameters. And it's producing planar data, like a new 2D data. And uh, from research and science, we know that when you look the same image from a different angle, you do interferometry. Then you can add the Haiti menu and we can bring into the data both the, the terrain elevation data and also the vegetation height data. And we think it's very, very valuable. And it's relatively cheap to do it uh, by adding just a passive receiver for the, the peak satellite. So that's information flying. You, we add one or uh, several smaller component satellites. So it's like where well, this main mission Sentinel 1 with the two. Uh, ton piece. The passive receiver can be just a few tens of kilograms. Uh, it must just have a high gain enough antenna to receive the radar signal and fast enough downwind to downwind the data. And uh, the whole idea has been developing now in the Estonian space community for past five, six months. And more and more people are starting to like it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Why? Because it's like, uh, it's doubling. Of course, it's a marketing term and you can challenge it. But definitely raising the value of Sentinel-1 data significantly with just a fraction of additional investment. And uh, the similar things have been done in research already. There are missions uh, like uh, SRTM, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. There is uh, Tandemix still operational. There is hot plan harmony, but they're all kind of like some limited time uh, generating the data and they, they're really not producing the data in scale. Uh, but there is nothing uh, stopping to, to make it to scale. And why we need it? Uh, everybody talk about the green deal and the carbon crediting market is very active, but there are huge errors. Like we talk with the uh, ER and they said that they tell that oh, there is like 50% error in the 
in some of the methodology, and it's true, because uh, there isn't just uh, reliable data. And if we would add the health dimension, then we could globally measure the vegetation health several times per week. And it would be a beautiful data source, not only for the carbon crediting, but whatever you want to know what's happening with our homeland. There are defense applications for this, agricultural applications for it, forestry applications. Uh, and mapping this vegetation is becoming more and more important, especially as we transform from oil-based economy to bio-based economy. So it's a resource. We need to map where is the resource and what is uh, happening with the resource. Now it's interested in the transfers and that the oil alignment is missing. The last point is that we just come from the Nisa Living Planet Symposium, a major observation event, and the feedback we got there is uh, uh, really positive. I was totally ready to get uh, harsh criticism. But hey, you kids, you know nothing what you're doing. We didn't receive it. We, we got really that there is a lack of leadership, lack of initiative, uh, that somebody would just take it to focus and start doing it. Obviously, Estonia wouldn't do it alone. We need uh, international cooperation. Uh, but we have this uh, partners network that can be woken up and, uh, and made to happen. I, I think we are talking here about five time steps. And the value, uh, the magnitude of the investment we are talking are about tens of millions, but the main mission price was uh, 200 millions. So it's a fraction of it, and the returns are, I would say, massive. It's uh, this data set would be interesting not only for us, but uh, for a lot of countries around the world. Uh, last topic. So this is a bit uh, touching the philosophical uh, thing. I'm looking at that this uh, earth observation, climate science, and uh, I, I see that this is totally still underestimated uh, by community, by economy, and I, I, I think it deserves at least ten times more talent attention than it currently receives. And I really like. Uh, yeah, optimizing the transport of people and food by further 5% is not really the greatest challenge of our time. And uh, there is no, no other plan. And we need more, more people thinking in long term, uh, really are not only in short term profits, uh, both from the investor side and the government. A large part of our problems comes that we optimize the benefits in too short time frame. And we need more thinking of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ahead, uh, because eventually it will come. And we, we cannot think like uh, this uh, French scheme, this Louis said, after me, what comes, I don't care. If all, every generation uh, thinks like this, then we won't uh, get far. So that's why I, I, I invite that we need more talent attention to the earth observation data science and uh, climate science. And uh, luckily, it's possible to do uh, thesis with our companies. And if you go to the thesis list of uh, Computer Science Institute, then there are uh, this listed. And currently, there are these uh, four topics, which are very interesting for us. Uh, if uh, any of these are uh, talking to you or you know somebody, then uh, you are most welcome to come to talk with us. You can also come with your own topic. When we get an agreement, uh, we also like it. We think it's relevant. Uh, you can do it. We can also do some other topic. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much. I guess again, uh, while the audience makes their minds, I will. I I I, I can't help but peek on some of the things you said. And uh, the one I, I want to start was the last one, saying that uh, optimizing uh, transportation is not going to cut it. So basically, ADL people come to Kapazet, basically. No, no, no. I, I'm not wanting actually to particularly attack some certain company or some, some certain research group. That was not the point. The, my, my point is that, like in general, a lot of investments are, are on topics which 
like if you take a fraction of this investment to the climate and earth observation of it, it's already a big win. This is my point. I don't want to like attack Volt or attack the research here. It, it's also nice, but I'm telling that the, all of the attention shouldn't go there, and more attention deserves the earth observation. But yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it, I mean, it's it's an open academic discussion, and sure. we can. Uh, Weight our, our values and biases and come to the agreement that yes, indeed, uh, Earth observation. My question was not about this, but actually was about so saying this and then having your uh, topics or thesis topics on the next slide, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, which one of them, so modeling greenhouse gas emission, right? Mm -hmm. But what are the other things that would you directly help? not to have the planet B type of thing. So have us settled on planet A. So with, how do you specifically, your company, your team, is helping us to uh, stay in that environment for a long enough? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things is making satellite data more easy to use for non-expert users. And with Kappa one we are solving it. Uh, and to, to make kind of like this pre-processing pain away uh, but because a lot of users don't want to become SAR experts, but they will benefit from the data. And so that's like helping other researchers to use satellite data more easily. Uh, and then obviously this uh, greenhouse gas modeling topics. Uh, but a any like climate science understanding Earth as a planet, I think the focus really is on like, it's not, it's not like that we need some like more money or more uh, Data, but we need more understanding. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. I've got two questions. First one is business related. So uh, uh, I got the impression that you've got uh, some services that are providing services to governments or individuals uh, like farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, did I understand correctly that these are commercialized or all of them are funded by some agency and <coughs> Providing these uh, services under some uh, kind of a free, open, public platform. And that's a good question, and the answer is yes and uh, no, depending on the application. So, uh, some of the things are free and open, and some are uh, commercial. I, I don't believe in like totally locking in everything. I think we need to return something for the community. So this cloud mask is free and open. Uh, for example, this biomass layer will be uh, sold. Did it answer to your question? Yeah, I, I, I had this question uh, like a follow up. So I would like to see like uh, how the business could stay uh, sustainable, like from the business perspective, uh, while uh, having all this uh, giving back to the community. I mean, these funds may exist today, but may not exist tomorrow. So um, how to kind of balance them out? to get to the both worlds. So I, I think this is really a tough question, and if you would help to solve it, uh, this would uh, be a big thing for the whole your purpose of this community, because there has been a market failure for decades actually already. And now we see the market slowly growing, slightly more than 10% per year, but as it's often like government-driven, uh, uh, government contracts, then it is, uh, Let's say not, uh, it is not the clear uh, free market. Mm. For sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, if I may, a uh, second question that is yeah. uh, really more technical. Uh, so, you talked a lot about this uh, satellite imagery and yeah. the uh, services that are built upon all this. Uh, yeah. And now I'm wondering if uh, there is uh, any existing services or any part of the service that uh, could uh, employ. Meta predictions, uh, particularly this meta um, uh, predictions based on simulating the atmosphere, uh, like uh, in applications related to, for example, the yield. So when we cultivate to get a better yield from the uh, ground for farmers, like uh, if any of the data, like additional data to use, uh, would be useful, or it's uh, not possible for some challenges or difficulties that wouldn't make any sense at all to combine. Uh, very relevant topic. 
weather data. And I think there are two things we have to differentiate. One is weather prediction, and other is weather observation. And many of these, especially this uh, agricultural applications, uh, benefit from uh, weather observations. So in situ networks, uh, like also weather uh, satellites measuring the parameters, uh, just feeding in uh, this weather data on top of the agricultural, like our satellite imagery data, improves the end user models most of the cases. On the other hand, it's also very important to understand that the current numerical weather model forecasts rely heavily on satellite data. And this uh, accuracy we have used, it, it would not be possible without both the geostationary orbit uh, scanners and the uh, lower orbit uh, imagery. There is this famous story from this yellow newspaper that uh, some little bit ignorant US senator says that why I need to spend, uh, I don't know, five billion dollars for a new weather satellite if I can open the TV and watch the weather forecast every day. He didn't make the connection <laughs> that he's relying on this. I uh, forget we have one more question from the audience. So, a semi philosophical question. So, recently, a paper came out uh, in the pharmacology field that uh, we said the machine learning approaches in a weird way. Instead of trying to make something that is um, very non poisonous, let's say a trap that would do its thing but not be poisonous to people. Uh, basically, some people figured, let's, let's turn it around and try to make as poisonous uh, things uh, as possible. And what they found was that uh, the network discovered uh, tons of new poisonous uh, compounds and a couple of uh, compounds uh, that are already known to be poisonous. So they sort of validated that, yeah, the other, other compounds are probably really toxic as well. And uh, the problem is you can order the synthesis of basically whatever chemical from some organic synthesis company and maybe they do a search but they find nothing so they wouldn't even know that it's a toxic compound or a precursor so basically you could um, use these sort of data and uh, the networks in uh, an evil manner so what's the most evil thing that you could do with earth observation data if you have lots of open data and uh, no regulation who is using it. So imagine yourself to be an evil genius, what would you do? <laughs> I don't know, I, 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 I never thought about my... <laughs> I think sometimes... <laughs> I, 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 come back with the biology, they, they also never thought about it. But I, I, I think sometimes it's it. sad that a lot of this uh, observation uh, research in the early days has been with the military use. And even like now, if you read some textbook, then in uh, synthetic upper to radar uh, like, uh, literature, they talk about targets. Even when it's an agricultural field. So it's a target. And it's, come on, it's not a target. I'm not going to shoot at it. So th this is one thing that's sad. But I, I think all of this, like, uh, both like, the if we understand our planet better, of how it functions, obviously, it also provides you. Uh, good ways to screw it up, like, how can I say, like, a powerful hacker or good hacker is, is not the good because, like, he's doing some magic, he just understands the system well, and he kind of, like, can abuse also the, the things of the system. So I, I think these challenges of this ethics will remain also in the Earth uh, system. And here maybe this, I don't know, decentralized, like, some kind of blockchain thing might, might help to uh, reduce the risk that, like, making sure that the whole uh, population of the Earth doesn't go crazy simultaneously. Something like this. Some kind of uh, check mechanisms in that to protect itself. I don't know if it answered your question. I think, uh, I think we, we are running out of time right now, so I think we'll uh, thank you again for a uh, for talk. Um, I think it uh, makes sense to have another clap round. Um, we'll see how, the, how, the, how this discussion goes. I think one of the first questions that I wanted to ask, since uh, I, I plan for it to be a more research-oriented uh, discussion, 
I, I, I wanted to ask you about the role of the model, uh, basically transformer models. So I know that uh, most of you haven't used the transformers, but they are so uh, kind of all over the place that it, it would be just a matter of time, I think, uh, before you try them. And if you do, then where would you try them? So I, I think, Marcus, you, you, you would be the one to uh, actually uh, actually responsible for the autonomous driving. <laughs> Sorry for that, but uh, you just happen to be here uh, on, on, that, on that note. So maybe you can elaborate what do you think would be the role of transformers in your uh, kind of research area? How would you use it? And, and yeah, so maybe you can give us a couple of ideas. And just a pretext for everybody else, um, so many of you know it, but some of you may not know it, the transformers Used to well is considered to be a new paradigm in many uh, in many fields, including computer vision, including semantic segmentation, uh, models like VID and uh, SWIN uh, considered to be a new state of the art in many many problems. So I've just been wondering, what are your thoughts about this? You don't even have to say where you would use it, but what are your thoughts? Have you tried? Um, because I myself would be interested to know that. But go ahead, shoot. Absolutely, but this yeah. is, yeah, it's not Yeah, 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 exactly. But the point that you tried this uh, DNC and how that is, it, the DNC didn't outperform that. And actually, like, in my opinion, there are many, many papers, articles about transformers and people like, you know, just about, like, wow, this is so amazing. But I also think that it's like, like, personally, for me, it's really difficult understand and I think that sometimes sometimes like more sophisticated doesn't mean better in my opinion. But, yeah. All right so you would say that a little so it's not yet there so that you would scream yay and drop everything else and just yeah. go for it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Also, do you have any sense I, I just the dust of time actually <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it makes sense. Uh, uh, I'm curious to try it out. I haven't, uh, haven't used it, so yeah. At the moment, yeah, most of the effort uh, gone into the wiring model. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, I would say I, I'm, in, I'm interested in using that, and uh, but uh, I'm not I'm not sure where yet. <laughs> Um, I, I can also respond for myself. Uh, so what happened is that we are experimenting with some of these transformers because um, but basically our domain is that we are um, interested in cell segmentation and in that sense it seems to be a pretty good tool to use so uh, we are definitely going to test it. Uh, I don't think we still have, we don't have it in the production. Uh, really made code, so we are uh, just looking into this. Uh, but yeah, that was just a uh, uh, kind of starter, uh, kind of conversation starter. Um, so our audience is interested in many things. Um, uh, one of the things is a question that is related to very uh, much ongoing, uh, still ongoing events of the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic, which we are living through. And I've just been wondering, um, have you ever thought about any implications uh, how your research can help? Basically, this is what the audience asked me, but I, I guess I'm a little bit re kind of reinterpreting the question because it's very much into my area, uh, which I will provide my, uh, my kind of view on. But generally, how do you see your research stopping big tragedies or big problems? So we have been talking about some of the first uh, science uh, durations, right? So what do you think is the biggest impact? Can you stop the pandemic? Can you stop deforestation? Can you stop people from dying on the, on the streets, under the cars? What, what do you think, what is the most impactful uh, piece of your research? How this outcome? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I 
I think it's uh, like just recently I was watching a movie about uh, climate change, and I was thinking that it's kind of like well, really crazy what is happening, and what I guess what we can do, I think, but I'm not really sure what maybe is just re like uh, raise this awareness for people what is happening. So it's about doing more. Some damaged area detection and kind of publish this results and like be really loud about this and then maybe can like numbers can people make can can make people believe that something is not okay and I think maybe we can provide this number somehow too. Okay. So you think that your research will raise the awareness about the problem? It can help. I mean we can do research in the silos, but we can do research in talk about publish it. Alright, makes sense. Okay, uh, okay. I agree entirely. Uh, because it's really important uh, the awareness. We might do our small things and might even make <coughs> something better, but if uh, anybody doesn't know about this or like it doesn't uh, go out of the big crowds, then it's yeah, it might be useful for let's say a couple of people or some some group of people, but yeah. Awareness makes a huge difference. Maybe to add about like this COVID case is a definitely a thing that, that uh, how can I say affected many people's lives. But uh, I would say that it, it's this climate change even more is on scale. Like uh, if entire things go wrong, that the consequences are way worse than for for COVID. And I. Second, for the awareness thing, it's not enough that the researchers know. If the researchers know and it is not transferred to the society, then we have all this, uh, and there is no link and uh, trust between the society and researchers. Then we have all these conspiracy theories going on and not trusting the researchers. And, uh, sometimes, like, I, I, I'm thinking that like, some, uh, some most crazy conspiracy theorists. I think that like somebody is uh, controlling all this, and uh, uh, and uh, researchers are evil. Like they should have, they should be just placed uh, some young researcher group, and they would feel that. But these are normal people here around us. These are like it's no magic that they do. They just do a lot of hard work. So I think it's very important that we communicate our results uh, to the community. And to to raise the awareness and also like the link to reach or like the conclusions to reach to the general public as much as possible. All right, uh, thank you. And I also wanted to so whoever wrote this question and the question sounded how AI can be used or how your research can be used to fight other pandemics taking lessons from COVID nineteen. Um, I, so I I kind of understand was a little bit towards my field. Uh, dealing with cells and, and uh, different diseases and that kind of stuff. So, from from my perspective specifically, I, I don't think that my specific research could have like stopped the pandemic. Although some of the some some of the mechanisms of the how the um, how cells interact with the environment and how the different treatment options and drugs interact with the cells. Could, could be studied via the microscopy images, and I think many of, of, of these do study uh, uh, this interaction uh, in the microscopy world. But, um, so, so there is definitely a connection, but I don't think it will, uh, so if the pandemic already started, then there's little, or at least there's a big delay until we can actually, our research can actually help stop these kind of uh, pandemics. Um, yeah, so this is just a um, side note, but I, I'm pretty sure that people who developed the vaccines against COVID, they actually did heavy uh, image analysis, they probably looked under the microscope on, on human cells and they probably did some uh, cell analysis, but I think pretty much a lot of things that uh, at least my group does uh, has been used in, in, uh, in stopping COVID as well. Um, not that I know exactly the protocols that they just to uh, make it very clear, I'm not saying that I know exactly what they have done. One question about, um, have you tried any 3D stuff? So uh, 3D object detection, 3D segmentation, 
are you interested? Um, what's your experience? And if you have done anything, then um, what's the uh, what's the model? What's the approach? Maybe I can start with it. Uh, not in the corporate sector one point time, but when we were still a research group, then uh, there is a whole lot of thesis uh, by IRS uh, for the forest heat measurement. And now this uh, last uh, like this uh, passive accompanying satellite concept, we just uh, like scale up this. So we have, we already have experience of how and the methodology how to do this vegetation heat uh, monitoring. Uh, so yes, we are looking into this and to like to put this data factory to work and to give this data for the world to use. All right. Um, thank you. 3D stuff, 3D object detection, 3D segmentation. No, I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't had experience. Yeah. So in, at least uh, in my company in Better Medicine, since I'm a co-founder of the company called Better Medicine, which is analyzing computer tomography scans, looking for cancers, this is essentially a 3D data. There is one very powerful framework called an NVNet, which is a model developed, very simple model, but it has a bunch of useful pre-processing steps specifically designed for the CT images, which actually looks through the CT and finds uh, tumors. It has been able to do it very well on a number of different uh, uh, cancer, cancer cases and cancer types. So in that sense, I, we have tried and it seems that it works pretty good. Um, and basically everything we do in a CT world is essentially a 3D. Using 2D doesn't seem to cut it um, because of the lack of the kind of. So there is a lot of information shared in the 3D one on the CD, uh, in the CD scan, so it, it makes a lot of sense to use 3D there. Also, in the cell world and the microscopy world, if you take multiple planes, uh, because you can actually focus on different distances, and you can take multiple pla planes, and that in that also uh, there's a lot of. There is a lot of value in using uh, 3D approaches. Not that we have done too much of that kind of stuff, but we are looking into also um, generating 3D volumes, uh, generating uh, data from uh, 3D. So, so that there is a lot of research going on in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Go on. Maybe to add a bit. Then actually then thinking of the Earth observation domain and especially the agricultural application, then for me it's like uh, in the art is hate dimension that uh, hate feature. Uh, for me it's hard harder I think to imagine uh, about uh, the applications which wouldn't benefit from it uh, compared to what would benefit from it. I think whatever you do crop classification, you do the mowing protection, you do harvesting protection. All of these end user models would benefit from these rich features. Uh, like how much the accuracy will improve, it's of course uh, application specific, but uh, I think most of uh, mathematicians, um, computer scientists, data scientists would love to have another linearly independent additional feature to describe your uh, problem. A cool thing. It makes sense, right? So you are adding up a lot more uh, data. So yeah. you, can, uh, you can make more um, evidence-based decisions. Exactly. The, the other way to go is like to go more proxy way. Mm -hmm. It's like to stack up a lot of 2D images and then you... It, it can even like lead to reducing the volume of data in some cases as you measure one dimension more directly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I would I would actually ask one more general question from the panelists, and then we can maybe turn to uh, audience, and still maybe the audience would ask some specifically, or maybe all of us together. So um, you have made great talks, by the way. Thank you very much for your presentations. I, I, at least I have enjoyed it. I hope that uh, people who stayed in still they have also experienced something similar. Um, so you presented your um, Fields and in your fields you have outlined some problems, right? You said that this uh, th there is this problem with the snow and there's a problem with this kind of prediction where the, uh, whether it turns or it doesn't turn and it being a little bit over 
confident and sometimes the underconfident. So I, I just wondered, what are the um, what do you see as the next challenge or biggest challenge that you uh, that you're facing? Not that snow is not properly segmented, but something that is that is looming on the horizon but not yet there, and you still uh, you probably will have to face that very soon, and it's going to be difficult. So what do you think is, is going to be a big problem in your domain uh, that, that you're kind of either looking forward to or the other way around, to kind of uh, being afraid, slightly worried about this thing? So what do you think is going to be a problem? What, what is the problem right now that you have? You don't know how to solve it all. It is, a, it is there, but you don't know how to solve it. For example, I can speak up from my experience, and I'm super worried about the domain shift. Uh, that there is uh, one data set that I know my models are going to work just fine, and then there is another data set, and I have no idea what's going to happen. Right, and I, I'm, I'm somewhat forced into this kind of situation when I, I have to just trust it to work, but I wish I could know better. I could know how exactly it's going to work. Can I predict how it's going to work? And I, I guess I haven't done, uh, we haven't done enough on, on this, Display and it's also very important for like critical applications. Uh, so your car is just being randomly reported to another place. You start the engine. Does it really understand what's happening out there, or it's not? Right. So so these kind of things really scare me off, and I just wonder uh, if you see any uh, these kind of obstacles in your field. Yeah, I can point me. Because uh, yeah, auto distribution, like you said, in autonomous driving field, uh, even in Estonia, we have four seasons. All the seasons are really different. Whether there is grass or is it some leaves on the ground or so, so, so many different things. Uh, and uh, to continue with that, is, uh, we are working in the safety direction. So this is a really important thing uh, also in safety direction. So know what's happening and uh, how confident the model is and this is uh, where the calibration comes in where it might help if we can calibrate for different scenarios or different uh, uh, like uh, contexts or different contexts uh, but, but you can't do it for the unseen context right you don't yes. know I mean, yeah this happen. is uh, you may be over overestimating yourself in in that room, but if you go to the next room, you're probably underestimating it. I don't know if that, if that works this way. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, out of distribution when you when this uh, context isn't even in the distribution. When you see something, uh, what the uh, model hasn't seen before, like in this case of pedestrians vehicles, there might be some weird vehicle or some weird cars or. And also these adversarial examples, uh, this, this is a whole different problem. Yeah, it's really scary. Yes. Uh, Anya, a couple? You know, for me, I get to look at it from Python Mac. It's always when I add some more data to that side, I'm like, I just don't really know what will happen because it's like desert for me. Something very different all the time. And for me, it's all about, like, it, in terms of compromise, Representation problem, but if you also talk about top classification, like two years ago, I guess it was like really hot summer, and then everything changed in this time series or this. And I tested the model, and you can't imagine how many potatoes are strawberries just in the story. You just can't imagine. Uh, yes. And also, like every time, like, I, I think that like, sometimes people really worried about model architecture, but what I think is the data matters a lot. And I remember we had the machine learning lecture with me, and there was like a, a, a lecture when you said like three times, depends on data, depends on data, and you're like, oh, always, uh, I'm coming back to that. Oh, why well, it doesn't work for that, depends on data. <laughs> I actually, I, I know about this, but you saying that all the time, so I decided that I was really using that uh, as an excuse as well. When you ask me questions, I'm also quoting you and saying, uh, like Mary say, it all depends on me. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Koko, what do you think? 
make it more like kind of like I don't know organizational worries or challenges ahead. Uh, I'm a fan of like both open data and also open science and open technology. And I would like to go to this direction more, but I see like that the recent ongoing war and like this uh, like can, can we publish everything, can we share everything for everybody? This is obviously sad. <laughs> Uh, would like to do it, but it seems that we can. Yeah, it's so I can relate to the organizational worries, but is there any technolo technological worry that if somebody asks you, can your company do this? You're like, no way. Is there anything that uh, of that kind that you're going to say, no, um, this is too difficult, uh, no way there, or you will maybe you will say yes, uh, sounds good, but then you will come to the team and say, I don't know what to do now. Mm. I would say everything is possible. Question is like, uh, who is willing to pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very business perspective. I, I know it. I see my CEO doesn't say basically. Okay, okay. So whatever. The, the, the other worry I have is still about like this eco, like the economic system apparently, but is rewarding mainly making more money. I think that if they could somehow tweak it to reward more, making more, more meaningful science or more meaningful new knowledge. Then this would, uh, humanity would benefit enormously from, from it. Obviously, it's a top for one to figure out, but I think if we could crack it, like if humanity could crack it, this would be a huge uh, win. Uh, I believe so. So that uh, kind of during the discussion of the fundamental science funding, right? So the fundamental <laughs> science does not produce all of those mm -hmm. right away, at least. Mm -hmm. Yet we uh, obviously all use the uh, fruits of the fundamental science. Anyway. Um, I think that's uh, that was uh, maybe just an exchange between us. Oh, they actually, we actually been told that that's <laughs> it. Um, so I think we, we just can uh, thank the panelists. Uh, <laughs> thank you, audience. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And uh, yeah, see you next time, right?